from the physical environment to our behavioral patterns, math is all around us. It is an integral part of society and likewise in the study of society. With mathematical theory, there is power to analyze behavior and decision-making in the context of a social world. The field of social sciences utilizes mathematical concepts as tools in examining social issues that deal with power, politics, and participation. But how does math really connect to concepts and ideas in the social sciences? In this module, we seek to uncover the framework math provides to explain social phenomena such as voting systems, weighted voting systems, and power, and fair division and apportionment. To premise our discussion in figuring in mathematics in the realm of the social sciences, we will begin with one of the most fundamental lessons we learned in this field which highlights the importance of our role as members of the society, to exercise our right to vote. As stated in Article 2, Section 1 of the 1987 Philippine Constitution, the Philippines is a democratic and republican state. Sovereignty resides in the people, and all government authority emanates from them. It is important to recognize that participating in elections not only satisfy both our right and duty as citizens of a democratic country, but it also reminds us of our inherent power to determine the future of the land by electing the rightful leaders. Our human right to vote is embodied in three instruments, specifically under the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, Article 21, Sections 1 to 3, Article 25, Sections A to C of the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights, and Article 5, Sections 1 to 2 of the 1987 Philippine Constitution. So, this coming 2022 elections, let us all exercise our right to vote. Needless to say, be wise in selecting our next set of leaders. We don't need another bunch of clowns turning the government into a full-blown circus, don't we? Now that we've established the social relevance of voting and elections, let's head on to the mathematics behind the electoral process. It is not just a matter of counting votes correctly, but understanding how we use mathematics to design, analyze, and compare different election methods. Voting theory is a framework that falls under the area of social choice theory. The social choice theory, which is generally the study of collective decision processes and procedures, is pioneered by Nicolas de Condorcet and Jean-Charles de Bourdin in 18th century. It is not a single theory, but a cluster of models and results concerning the aggregation of individual inputs such as votes, preferences, judgments, and welfare into collective outputs. The prime example of which is elections wherein varied and conflicting choices are consolidated into a single choice of the group that best reflects the desires of each individual. Apart from integration and consolidation, another underlying mathematical concept for the creation of voting systems is that of order. This is drawn from the premise of the order theory in math, which deals with the ways in which objects can be ordered, from simple ordering of integers from smaller to bigger, or ordering of subsets of a set via inclusion, to more complicated relations. In real-life setting, Little acts of putting things in order just like how a teacher records the names of students in alphabetical order makes everything more systematic and efficient. As mentioned, voting systems best exemplify the idea of setting things in order. By definition, voting system is a way for a group to select one winner from among several candidates. From electing your homeroom officers in high school to selecting the next chairperson of the student council in your university, to the local and national elections, a particular voting system is always employed. One example of voting system is the rank or preferential voting system. This is an electoral system that allows people to vote for multiple candidates in order of preference. This means that instead of just choosing who you want to win, you fill out the ballot saying who is your first choice, second choice, or third choice for each position. This type of voting system is commonly used in countries like Ireland, New Zealand, and Australia. One condition that voting systems aim to satisfy is transitivity. This means that relative preferences are not altered by the elimination of one or more candidates. Say for instance you are to choose from three distinct candidates, X, Y, and Z. If you prefer candidate X to Y, and you prefer candidate Y to Z, 
then it must be the case that you are also going to prefer candidate X to Z in an instance where candidate Y is eliminated. Apart from transitivity, another principle that should be met in designing a voting system is what we call fairness conditions or principles. These are desirable conditions that make the elections fair or positive from the point of view of the voters. More of this will be discussed in the succeeding slides later on. From voting systems, we now move to voting methods. Voting method refers to the mathematical process, algorithm, or manner in which individual votes are counted and consolidated to produce a winner. There are four voting methods we are going to focus on. The plurality method, the board account method, the pairwise comparison method, and the plurality with elimination method. The plurality method is the simplest and most popular method of voting. Here, a candidate with the most number of votes or most first place votes wins. In the Philippines, we use the single winner plurality voting, in which each voter votes for one candidate and the candidate with the most votes is elected. Plurality shouldn't be confused with majority voting. Recall that during the 2016 presidential elections, Duterte won by plurality, not majority. Although his 16 million votes rank the highest among the other presidential candidates, note that there are about 45 million valid votes, which means that out of that 45 million, 25 million didn't vote for him. In more specific terms, the number of people who did not vote for him are greater than those who did. To give an illustrative example, let us look at this table. Suppose A, B, C, and D are candidates for the presidential elections. Based from the tally, candidate A has the most number of first place votes, which is 14. Hence, candidate A is the winner. However, if you are going to calculate the number of votes who didn't choose A as their first choice, which is 23 of the voters, we will see that candidate A isn't the choice of the majority. This is one of the reasons why plurality isn't always the best method, because it failed to satisfy a basic principle of fairness called the Condorcet Criterion. The Condorcet Criterion is a basic principle of fairness which suggests that the winner in an election should be the candidate who wins in a one-to-one -one comparison with any other alternative. This will be further elaborated when we tackle the third type of voting method. The second voting method is the board account method. This is a weighted voting method wherein each place on a ballot is assigned points. The board account method was designed to avoid some of the problems with the simple plurality method. This method is named after Jean Charles de Bordeaux a French statesman, scholar, and contemporary of the Marquis de Condorcet. Going back to our previous example, the idea is pretty simple. Give the candidates points according to their places on each ballot. From the table, we can see that first choice votes are given 4 points, second choice votes are given 3 points, third choice votes are given 2 points, and the last choice is equivalent to 1 point. The points are tallied for each candidate, and the candidate with the highest total points wins. Unlike the result from the plurality method, candidate B with 106 points wins using the board account method. The third method is the method of pairwise comparisons. This is a method of comparing candidates to each other in head-to-head -head match -ups. Each of these one-to-one -one pairings is called a pairwise comparison. The winner of each head-to-head match-up gets one point. The winner of the election is the candidate with the most number of points. Applying the transitivity principle discussed earlier, we can see that if we are going to compare the voter's choice between A and B, 14 prefers A while the rest would prefer B. Hence, B wins earning a point. The same goes if we compare A and C and A and D and so on. Calculating the score, we have 0 for A, 2 points for B, 3 points for C, and 1 point for D. Candidate C with 3 points is therefore the winner. The advantage of this method is that it satisfies the Condorcet criterion, which all the other methods violate. 
The last type of voting method is the plurality with elimination method. This is a sophisticated version of the plurality method and is carried out in rounds. The method starts by eliminating the candidate with the fewest number of first place votes. And this process is repeated round by round until a candidate with the majority of first place votes emerges. Going back to our previous example, we can see from the table that B has the least number of first place votes, therefore B is eliminated in the first round. This will lead to a reduced table that looks like this. If we combine the identical columns, we can see that candidate C will be eliminated for round 2. Repeating the same process, the last round shows that A has less first place votes than D, hence candidate D is the winner. Comparing the four methods, we can see that different results are obtained using each method. In addition to the previously discussed Condorcet criterion, there are five other fairness principles. Firstly, we have the majority criterion. Let's say na sa isang election, majority ng voters ay pumili kay candidate X bilang kanilang first choice. This means that si candidate X ay ang dapat na manalo. Secondly, we have the monotonicity criterion. Let's say na sa unang election, si candidate X ang panalo. Sa re-election, lahat ng voters na pumalit ng kanilang boto ay pabor lamang kay candidate X. This means that si candidate X pa rin ang panalo. Thirdly, we have the independence of irrelevant alternatives criterion. Let's say na si candidate X ang nanalo sa election. Even if one or more candidates are removed from the election at nag-recount sila ng votes, si candidate X pa rin ang considered na panalo. Fourthly, we have unanimity. In this case, should every voter prefer a certain candidate, meaning na may unanimous na preference ang voters, that specific candidate should be the winner. And lastly, we have non-dictatorship. In this case, the outcome of an election should not be simply influenced by a single individual, habang ini-ignore lamang yung preferences ng ibang voters. As mentioned, meron tayong four voting methods. In relation to fairness principles, these four voting methods cause different election outcomes that may violate one or more fairness principles. To illustrate, the following example is about the election of an organization's chairperson. There are 15 org members and four candidates. By the board account method, candidate B wins with 48 points. However, by the majority criterion, candidate A wins with votes from 8 out of 15 org members. In this case, the outcome of the board account method violates the majority criterion. Since based dun sa majority criterion, 8 org members chose candidate A as their first choice. From the discussions and examples stated, there are two key takeaways. Firstly, different voting methods produce different outcomes or winners of an election. Secondly, voting methods cause violations of particular fairness principles. Now what does this say about the nature of voting methods? Is there even a best voting method? Well, experts declare that there is no ideal voting method. And the mathematical basis for this claim lies in Kenneth Arrow's Impossibility Theorem. Kenneth Arrow, in his PhD dissertation entitled Social Choice and Individual Values, examined the following ideas as applied to ranked voting systems. First, there is no voting system that would obey, in all possible voting instances, the following fairness principles, monotonicity, independence of irrelevant alternatives, unanimity, and non-dictatorship. This claim is further supported by mathematical proof as integrated by order theory. Second, there is no consistent method for a democratic society to make a choice that is always fair. The choice is made from among three or more alternatives, and fair in this context is used to describe an instance where a fairness principle is not violated. But despite the inability of voting methods to satisfy fairness principles, there are alternative methods that voting experts consider strong. An example is the approval method. 
in this method, voters are not asked to rank candidates. Rather, they are required to give their approval to as many or as few candidates from a given set of candidates. This method is applicable to smaller voting populations like legislatures or organizations. According to advocates of the approval method, it has the following advantages. It is easy to understand, simple to implement. Voters are given flexible options, which increases in voter turnout. Helps elect strongest candidates. It is a method unaffected by the number of candidates and will reduce negative campaigning. In general, the approval method puts less pressure on the voters as compared to a ranked voting system, where voters must rank candidates from best to worst. Next is the discussion of weighted voting system and the measurement of power. In this slide, I included the principle of one person, one vote. This is to emphasize that not all voting systems adhere to this kind of principle. Rather, voting systems like weighted voting system means that the voting rights among all voters are not equally divided. An example of this is the corporate shares, shareholders meeting, um, wherein Yung power now is determined rather by the amount or value of his or her share sa isang corporate. So basically, when we say weighted voting system, all we need to do is to consider who has more power, how is power measured, and if there is a mathematical treatment of power. Next, when we also say weighted voting system, there are three ingredients. One of the ingredients is the players which are the voters of a votation. Next we have the weights which is the players control over a number of votes and then the quota which could be represented by Q which is the total minimum number of votes necessary to pass a motion. Ito yung number of votes na dapat ma-reach in order for a person a, or a proposition to win the votation, which is usually higher than 50%. So, dito sa example na meron tayo, we can see the number 13, which represents the quota. Next, we have the numbers 8, 6, 4, 3, 2, 1. Um, each number is one player. And yung 8, yung value ng 8, is the weight na meron yung isang player. Next, we have the concept of bands of index and the mathematical measurement of power. So, ito ay isang method na pre-noduce ng isang lawyer, namely John Bansoff. So, dito sa example na meron tayo, we can observe that the first column is the coalition. Next, we have the column of weight. Then the winning or losing column. Dito sa coalition, we have A, B, C, D, and so on. Um, we have the P1, P2, P3. Ito mga to or coalitions because there they are any set of players na nagjoin force in order to vote together. So yung weight ng player one is 48, player two is 47, and so. Letter D coalition, we can observe that yung weight is 95, which is the sum of 48 and 47. So basically, yung 48, 47, and 5 na weight ng player 1, 2, 3 are considered losing coalitions because it does not meet the um, quota. Next, we also have the coalition D, E, F, G, um, which are the winning coalitions. So, we also have the concept of critical player. Itong critical player, it basically means that a player is necessary in order for a coalition to win. Next, for the next slide, we are going to discuss about the bands of power index. We have the concept of bands of index as well as the bands of power distribution. So, bands of index is the player's power is proportional to the number of times the player is critical. Well, balance of power distribution is the distribution of power among players. So, if we are going to look at the example a while ago, we can see that there, um, the player one appeared one, um, four times as well as the player two and three, and the total. So basically, the balance of power distribution is twelve, and the balance of index is four. So that is four twelve, and we if we are going to 
um, round it off, or in the Hebrew term, we are going to get the one third, which basically means that the critical um, aspect or amount of each player, or up to one third. The final section deals with division problems. To start off, fair division is an area of mathematics that deals with problems that involve the division of a certain set of goods among individuals that would be considered fair by the parties involved. Let us take for example the famous story about the dead father, his sons, and his camels. Three sons were left with 17 camels but they did not know how to fairly distribute it as 17 could not be divided. Luckily, a wise man came and helped them solve it. The solution of the wise man was fairly easy. First, he added his own camel, making them 18, and then he solved for the proportions. 1 ninth of 18 is 2, 1 third is 6, and 1 half is 9. Add them all up and we get 17. The wise man took his own camel and then left. The three children were left satisfied. One assumption in fair division is that a fair share is any share that, in the opinion of the player receiving it, is worth at least 1 over n of the total value. A fair division scheme has four properties. This decisive, internal to the players, assumes that the players have no knowledge about each other's value systems, and finally, assumes that the players are rational. There are two types of fair division problems. Continuous fair division problems are where infinite number of ways and shares can be increased or decreased by arbitrarily small amounts. Example, land, cake, and pizza. Discrete, on the other hand, involves indivisible objects like cars, houses, and boats. Under discrete fair division problems, we have apportionment. It is the process of allocating identical indivisible objects among participants entitled to unequal shares example congressional seats in the united states allocating congressional seats we use two ratios standard divisor and standard quota standard divisor is the ratio of population to seats it is the average number of people per seat standard quota is the ratio of state population to standard divisor it is the exact fraction of the total number of seats a state would be entitled to if seats were not indivisible. The formula for these two ratios are shown on your screens. To understand the concept of standard divisor and standard quota, let us have an example. It is the year 1790 and the U.S. population is 3,929,214 and the House of Representatives is to have 105 members. What is the standard divisor? What is the standard quota if the population of Virginia is 747,610? Using the formula for standard divisor and standard quota, we arrive at a conclusion. The standard divisor would be 37,421.09 or 37,421. Virginia would have 19 representatives at minimum or 20 at maximum. It would be dependent if they would choose their lower quota or upper quota. Now we go to some quota methods and paradoxes from quota method. There are two methods that we are going to discuss, namely the Hamilton method and the Lunas method. Both methods satisfy the quota rule. So in the next slide, to further explain the um, method, we are going to look into a situation where there are three states who are going to conduct a conference with only 100 seats. So to properly appropriate the number of seats for each state, we are going to use the Hamilton method and the Lonis method. So at the left table, we use the Hamilton method and the right table applies the Lonis method. So at the first row we, we can identify the total population which is equivalent to 1 million and then the standard quota, quota is shown at the next row and its usual round off on the third row and then we have the lower quota so basically bakit natin kinuha yung lower quota because as we can see sa usual round off yung 
total number of seats ay 101 which exceeded the number of seats na kailangan natin which is 100 lang. So, kukunin natin yung lower quota na nagtotal sa 98. So, since 98 lang yun, kulang ng dalawa, we have to identify which state is going to take the surplus seats. Um, for Hamilton method, ginamit niya ang absolute fraction part while Lona's method uses the relative fraction part. So, basically, when we say absolute fraction part, it is only the fraction part of the standard quota. For example, for state A, the standard quota niya is 65.7. So, yung fraction part niya is 0.7. And sa Lona's method naman, yung relative fraction part, makukuha yun by dividing the fraction part by the integer part. So, dito ulit sa state A, Kita natin, for example, 0.7 is divided by 67, 65 further. So, ayun, nakuha natin yung 0.01 to allocate which state will take the surplus seat. Titingnan natin kung ano yung mas malaki. And sa Hamilton method, nakita natin na states A and B took the surplus seats while states B and C took the surplus seats for Lona's method. So, both are quota methods. Next, we are going to discuss about the paradox wherein it is just the contradictory statement na pwedeng maging true since it is based on a valid deduction from acceptable premises. So, papasadahan lang natin itong types of paradoxes na meron tayo, namely the population paradox, the Alabama paradox, and the new state paradox. So, when we say para population paradox, it basically means na merong increase sa population ng state, kaya mababawasan yung seat allocation niya. Yun yung paniniwala sa, sa population paradox. While Alabama paradox believes that if the total number of seats increases, mayroong isang state na mababawasan yung seat allocation niya. While new state paradox, on the other hand, means that adding a new state with its fair share of seats can affect the number of seats due to other states. As we saw in the previous parts of the video, standard divisor and standard quota are mostly used in apportionment schemes. However, there are times when modified divisors are used instead. Modified divisor is obtained by trial and error and is used to get the modified quota. To obtain the modified quota, we divide the state population with the modified divisor. This type of apportionment is called divisor methods. There are three types of divisor methods. The first one is Jefferson method, which is attributed to Thomas Jefferson and was used from 1731 to 1830. Let us have an example. 10 seats should be allocated to a population of 1,100 consisting of three cities. City A has 696 people, B 268, and C 136. First, we get the modified divisor. Modified divisor is calculated using the formula population over number of seats. Using the values in our problem, we obtain 110. Now that we have our first modified divisor, we assign seats using these steps. Step 1, calculating the standard quota. We can remember that the formula for standard quota is number of seats multiplied by state population over total population. Using this, we obtain the following answers. Step 2 is assigning the lower quota. Remember that in obtaining the lower quota, we simply round down each standard quota in the, in the nearest whole number. We have 6, 2, and 1. Step 3, if there are surplus in seats, Modify the divisor so that when each state's modified quota is rounded down, no surplus seats remain. But since in our problem there is a surplus in seats, adjust the divisor, which is 110, to 98. Step 4 is just repeating step 1 and 2 but with the new modified divisor. The new lower quota obtained are 7, 2, and 1. Adding them all together, we get 10. 
second divisor method is Atham's method. It is from John Quincy Atham's but was never used by the Congress. It is very similar to Jefferson's method but used as a modified divisor larger than the standard divisor, which in turn produces smaller modified causes that, that are rounded up. Consider the situation in our previous problem. To get the allotment for each city, we follow these steps. Step 1. Assigning upper cotas. You can remember that the standard cotas obtained are 6.33, 2.44, and 1.24. Rounding them up, we get 7, 3, and 2. But since these numbers give 12 seats, we modify the divisor to get smaller allocations. We choose a larger divisor than 110, say 135. Step 3 is assigning upper cotas using the new modified divisor. We get 6, 2, and 2. We get a total of 10 seats. The third and last divisor method is Webster's method, which is devised by Daniel Webster and was used in the 1840, 1910, and 1930 apportionments. Using the same problem, we are going to allot seats using these steps. One is rounding off the standard quotas in the usual way. We get 6, 2, and 1. Since this only results to 9 seats, we modify the divisor, say 107.2, to get larger allocations. Step 3 is once again calculating for the modified quota but using the new modified divisor. Remember that we should round them up in the usual way. So we get 6, 3, and 1. A total of 10 seats. This table shows the comparison of allotments decided using different methods. We see that after using the three divisor methods, we obtain three different apportionments. In Jefferson's method, city A is allotted 7 seats, B has 2 seats, and C has 1. In Adam's method, 6 seats is given to A, 2 to B, and C has 2. In Webster's method, A has 6 seats, B has 3, and C has 1. It is known that the three divisor methods can violate the quota rule. However, it can be proven that none of the three divisor methods can suffer from paradoxes. So the real question now is, which is better, quota method or divisor method? Mathematicians Michael Belinsky and H. Peyton Young tested this and obtained a result that says no apportionment is mathematically flawless. It is reflected in the table on your screens. According to Belinsky and Young, any apportionment method that does not violate the Cotter rule must produce paradoxes, and any apportionment method that does not produce paradoxes must violate the Cotter rule. Additional divisor method was proposed by Joseph Hill and Edward Huntington in 1911 and was adopted by the U.S. Congress in 1941. It is the method of equal proportions and is similar to Webster's method, but rounding off depends on the geometric mean. At the geometric mean, we obtain the modified quota, and if modified quota is between integers n, and n plus 1, then the geometric mean would be the square root of the product of n and n plus 1. If the modified quota is less than or equal to the geometric mean, then the modified quota is rounded down. If the modified quota is larger than the geometric mean, then it is rounded up. A fun fact, the first U.S. presidential veto was a math bill. In 1791, President George Washington vetoed Hamilton's bill on apportionment. Jefferson's method was adopted instead.